Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. All right, I'm Nicole. I am definitely an alcoholic. Nicole. My sobriety date is September 20th of 2015, so no fronts, but if I stay sober for about another week, I'll get five years. Um, I'll try to keep this short and sweet so we get out of here in time, but no promises. Um, so I have a sponsor. She knows she's my sponsor because I talk to her daily, even at this point in my sobriety. Um, and I sponsor women. I think that second part is probably one of the biggest, most important parts of, um, my program. Uh, there was a time where I thought that wasn't for me and I got to see what happens when that's not for me. And I almost went back out. So today I sponsor no matter what. Um, so a little backstory, what it was like, um, I have a mom and dad that are super polar opposite of each other. My mom's like a big Bible thumper and my dad doesn't really believe God exists. Um, my mom's allergic to alcohol much differently than I am. She takes a drink of a beer and she's got a headache while my dad is allergic to alcohol in the same way that I am, that he is an alcoholic who hasn't found a solution yet. Um, so crazy enough, they didn't work out right Two two polar opposites like that didn't work out. So My parents got divorced when I was very young. That wasn't that big of a deal for me. It was probably like one of the best things that could have happened for me. Um, And my dad just wasn't really ready to be a dad. Um, But my mom, she she was made to be a mom, you know. So she she was a really amazing mom. I uh, lived with her mostly. And, um, you know, life was really great because she got married for the second time. Um, she's been married a few times. I have a lot of daddies growing up. Um, so, uh, you know, life was super great. I I had a dad that loved me. Um, I had everything I wanted. Um, and then, you know, my mom has a way of finding the drug addicts and alcoholics, which is super interesting. Cause like I said, she can't even drink a beer. Um, so that didn't work out for her. And, um, that's when I first started picking up resentments, right? Cause I met my now stepdad before I got rid of the first stepdad. Um, and it was like a light switch. I just became like this super angry child. Um, and now being an AA, I understand, um, you know, that resentments is the number one offender, right? Um, I had a lot of turbulent stuff happen in my life, um, growing up, but none of that is what makes me an alcoholic. What makes me an alcoholic is I have this disease, right, Um, that I form an obsession with alcohol. And once I put that alcohol in my body, like I'm drinking to overcome this allergy, right? Um, So anything that I tell you along the way that sounds kind of like, oh, that's not so good. That's not what makes me an alcoholic. And I know that today. Um, I know people that have seriously tragic lives that are not alcoholics, you know. Um, So when my mom married my third stepdad, I became super angry and my mom couldn't handle me anymore. So she kicked me out to live with my dad. Um, which, you know, through the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm able to have a beautiful relationship with him today. Um, but growing up, it was really hard. He was abusive in many ways. And I just didn't understand why he was the way he was, you know, now working my steps, I'm like, Oh, that's just how we are. Right. Um, and I, and I vowed I'd never grow up to be like him. Oh, forget about that thing. I, I vowed I would never grow up to be like him, which is kind of ironic, right? Cause this alcoholism was just kind of brewing within me. Um, and so like, I, I was kind of what you would call a late bloomer, I guess, you know, since I've been in the rooms, I realize I'm a late bloomer, but, um, I was super into church. I super loved Jesus. Um, you know, but I was just super angry, you know, I was super full of fear, Um, all these things started cropping up within me and, um, you know, forming this disease before I ever took my first drink. Um, and so when I went to my first party, um, you know, I was never, I never had a first drink, right? I I had a first blackout. Um, I can honestly tell you, I don't think there's ever been a time where I just had one beer, you know? Um, and I didn't think that wasn't normal. That whole saying, um, 
that you don't drink to get drunk. I was like, who does that? You don't drink to get drunk. Like, why would you drink for the taste, you know? Um, and then going to AA meetings, I was like, oh, okay. So that's probably what makes me an alcoholic. Uh, <laughs> cool. Um, so I, you know, I had my first blackout and, um, it was a really pivotal moment in my life, right? Like I said, I was like super into church. I love Jesus a lot. I was saving myself for marriage. Um, and that night I was raped by two men and that was like the turning point of my story, right? I was like, screw you, God, you can stay up there, leave me alone. I still believed in him, but I, ha I wanted nothing to do with him, right? Which, um was pretty detrimental because he was the only one that could save me. Right. And so, um, I decided shortly after that, um, I was told we can talk about other things here. So, um, you know, shortly after that, I started using, uh, marijuana to cope with all the things that were going in, going on inside my head, you know, and I just started to see that these outside things I could put in my body and it made me feel all right you know, and I thought it made me super cool because I could drink like the guys and because I could probably drink them under the table, um, that I could always smoke more weed than them. And, you know, looking back, like, it's like, that wasn't that cool. It just made me the alcoholic in the group. Right. Um, you know, so I decided to drop out of high school cause who needs to do that? <laughs> um, and I, I'm going to work, you know, and, um, you know, that's where my life started kind of going downhill a little bit. It wasn't just like, poof, but, um, it definitely started going downhill. Um, I, I started moving to other, um, other substances other than alcohol. Um, I like how the big book talks about like the al alcohol is but a symptom, right? So like the, and my disease just has a lot more symptoms that are chemical than just alcohol. Um, and so I got introduced to, and I kind of like to share my two bottoms because I think it's really important to know that like everybody's bottoms look different. Right. And I got sober for, uh, or I got off of drugs and then got off of alcohol at two different points, you know, and I'm really grateful for that because that gives me the experience that my bottom doesn't have to look necessarily the same to be a bottom, right? Like my bottom was enough to make me need to get sober or want to get sober. Um, so I got introduced to, um, some party drugs and that's how it all started with me. And, um, I was like, well, you know, you can't do party drugs and, and still go to work. So I'll just start doing heroin during the week. Cause that's logical. <laughs> um, it was super logical at the time. Um, you know, and like at that point I wasn't someone that got super addicted to it. Right. Like I didn't get sick. I thought everyone was a bunch of babies. I'm like, I must be superwoman, you know? Um, yeah, no. Uh, so that went on for a while. I lost my first apartment within like two months of living there. Uh, cause I always just had to like buy drugs with my rent money. Um, and you know, and then I met like the first love of my life. I have many loves in my life, just like my mom. Um, and you know, at the time he's like, yeah, I'm an ex meth user and, um, I just smoke weed now. And I'm like, okay, cool. Everybody's got a pass, whatever, you know? <laughs> uh, and like, that was like my first like introduction to someone that, you know what I mean? Like, and so, um, I lost my job. Right. And he, he had relapsed, which was like super interesting. Cause that was the first time I ever saw someone, um, using, um, IV drugs. Right. And I was like, well, this is interesting. We'll have to visit this later and talk about this later, you know, kind of killing my buzz right now. Um, but I lost my job and he had already went back to selling drugs and I grew up in like Peoria, Arizona. So like not really like in the, in the heat of it, you know, like I thought I was gangster. I definitely was not. Uh, <laughs> But, um, you know, I was like, I don't know what to do. And he's like, well, you can come live with me, but your whole life's about to change. And I was like, you don't know me, you know, I can handle it. <laughs> Absolutely cannot handle it. Um, and so like the first night that I was down in there in the slopes with him, uh, he, you know, I had done Xanax all day. I was super tired. I didn't want to go to bed. And he's like, well, if you want to try this to get up and stay up with me, um, you know, that's cool too. So I tried meth for the first time. I absolutely hated it. Um, honestly, I hated most drugs the first time I tried them, but I was like, Oh, I'll just, I'll just give it another whirl. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, um, and like looking back, it's like, that was that obsession, right? Like, because even though every part of me 
um, did not want to do it. I was already powerless to it at that time, right? Like I just wanted to escape the way I was feeling. And um, so like after the first time I did it, I felt super crazy. So I was like, okay, I'm never going to do it again. And then two weeks later, I tried it again and I was hooked. That was it. That's all she wrote, right? Um, I came into the drug world dating a dope dealer and, um, that gave me this sense of like all these things I'd never do. Right. Cause there was these women doing all these things with my boyfriend that they should not be doing. Um, you know, I was like, Oh, I'd never sleep with someone that, that has a girlfriend or a wife or whatever for my drugs. I'd never do this. I never do that. Right. Um, but very quickly, all those things, uh, started becoming a part of my life. You know, we draw those lines in the sand and we're like, Oh, I'll never, I'll never, I'll never. Right. And like, yeah, like that sounds like a good idea until like that addiction or that alcoholism has taken such a hold of you, you know? Um, so, you know, another thing the big book talks about is fear, right? Like driven by a hundred forms of it. For me, I think it's a lot more than that. Um, as I look back through my life, even right now, right? Like I, I still have these fears that sometimes drive me, but today I have a solution um, that gives me the gift of awareness to be able to see these things and be like, Oh, wait a minute. Like I'm living in fear. What do we do about it? Right. Um, but anyway, so I stayed with that guy out of fear. I was more afraid of being alone than being in an abusive relationship. Um, I stayed in that relationship for way too long. Um, you know, and, and then I met the second love of my life. So I was able to leave him and, you know, everything was groovy with that. And then he went to prison and that's when I found myself back on heroin, you know, and I'm so grateful for that because it took me to my knees a lot quicker than, um, alcohol would alone or meth would alone. You know, I know, I know all these other things would have done it just by itself, but like heroin just like expedited the process a lot. Um, I found myself doing things I thought I never would. Um, you know, that whole idea that I was like, oh, I would never sleep with someone that is married or whatever, you know, that it became not so important to me that his wife and kid could be right out the front door while I'm doing what I got to do to get high, you know, and, and I'm meeting all these lines in the sand and it's not even like, it's not even taking me off guard, right? It's just, I got to do what I got to do. Um, I became a pretty heavy IV drug user early on in my, in my walk with drugs and, um, I told myself I'd never use someone else's needle. And I found myself using, um, people's needles that I knew had hep C, right? Like it didn't matter to me. I, like, I just needed to do what I needed to do to get what I needed. Right. Um, I just, I was just doing all these things because I was completely powerless over, over drugs. And I, I realized it, right. It wasn't that I was like out there oblivious to the fact that like, Oh, I got this. No, I knew I didn't have it. And it was the most depressing feeling I had ever felt. Right. So, um, I just remember being on a bathroom floor and being like, God, if this is it for me, like if, if I'm never going to find a way off of this stuff, you need to just take me out, you know? And it gave me a little hope that, uh, he didn't take me out. I'm like, Oh, maybe you'll come in on the other side of that prayer someday, you know? But I just did not, I could not come to believe that a power greater than myself could, could, heal me. Right. It was just, it was so impossible. Um, so one of my biggest ways of getting through life was I was a master manipulator. You know, I'm a female. I didn't really have to have a hustle other than that. Um, and I met this guy that completely altered, um, how my life went. Um, I had tried to manipulate the wrong guy as sometimes it goes. And, um, he ended up roofing me and, um, and beating me within inches of my life after taking me to, to California. Right. Um, and I, I remember waking up being like, well, this is not good. You know, I went to sleep in Phoenix, Arizona, and I'm waking up in California and I have no one that I know around me. Um, he wanted me to work for him. And I was like, you know, I'm not really above that, that whole idea, but I'm not going to do it for someone else. You know what I mean? Like I'm that selfish and self-centered that that's mine, you know? Um, and so when I, when I refused to do that, like he beat me within inches of my life and it was the best thing that ever happened to me because in that moment, um, all of a sudden all I had was God, right? Like it took me back to that, 
you know, like those foxhole prayers, like, all right, God, if you just do this, you know? And, and I, I remember just telling God, like everything slowed down so much. I just remember telling God, like, not like this, you know what I mean? Like you can take me out any other way, but not like this, because this will make my family sad if I die like this, right? If I overdose, they'll just be mad, right? Which is crazy. That's, that's not true. When we overdose, our families really do, really do take it hard. Um, you know, so it was like crazy. Like God just like made that man stop it was a miracle. And I was, you know, like God, God could have allowed for that situation not to happen, but he allowed it to happen because he knew it was what was going to save my life. Right. Um, so I ended up going to the hospital and I had warrants, um, that I didn't know they did warrant checks at hospital. So I was pretty shocked when they did that. Um, uh, the cop was like, all right, I'm going to take you with me. And I was thinking, oh, cool. I'm going to go to a woman's shelter. This will be great. And she's like, put your hands behind your back. And I was like, oh, okay. So I went to jail. Um, it was a lot nicer in California jail than here. They feed you three times a day. So that was nice. Um, but you know, while I was there, I just had, like, I talked to my sister and she's like one of the most important people in my life. Um, and I was like, man, please forgive me. You know, like I'll do anything. And she's like, sure. Just don't do drugs when you get back. And I was like, you got it. I promise. You know, and I hung up the phone and I was like, oh my gosh, what did I just tell this kid? You know, like for me, I was never the type of person that liked using drugs, you know, like I hated it every day. And I'm like, if I could quit, I would have, you know? So I'm like, all right, God, you like really pulled something amazing off. I, I need you to do it again. I need you to help me to not do drugs. And I do not know what that's going to take, you know? And for me, my story is a little different. Like that obsession to use drugs was just lifted. I know it's not that way for everybody. Um, sorry, my watch is saying weird things. Um, I know that's not that way for everybody. So if that's not your story, don't freak out and be like, Oh my gosh, I'm broken because it's not like, it happens for everybody at different points of, of their sobriety journey. Um, for me, that's just how it happened. But, um, I, I, long story short, I, I got out of jail. I got put on probation and, um, you know, I'm grateful for that because one of the terms of my probation was not to drink. Right. And I thought, well, I'm just a drug addict, so this is totally fine. I, I can just drink and, you know, and, and that'll be cool. Um, but you know, looking back, if someone tells you that you're going to go to prison for five years, if you drink a beer and you still drink that beer, like there might be something wrong, you know? Um, so I continued to drink alcohol, um, for another two years. And, um, like right when I was getting off of probation, I had this aha moment, right? Like God completely flipped my life like in 180 degrees and, and fixed everything for me. And here I was still getting blackout drunk, um, totally disrespecting this life that God gave me. Right. And so I had another moment with God where I was like, you know, man, like I saw what you did with, with drugs. I need you to do that with alcohol, you know? Um, and, it was really hard for me to admit that I was an alcoholic because that was just the spiritual bottom. Right. And like, I'm used to like, as I told you, my bottoms being bottoms, like where I'm just like homeless and selling myself and all this, getting myself into scary situations, you know? And so for it to be just a spiritual bottom, I didn't know that that, that I was really an alcoholic until I came to AA. Right. And I got to hear about these people in these meetings and I'm like, Oh, wow that's me. And that's me. And that's me. You know, um, obviously I could go be a part of a bunch of fellowships, but I only ever had a love for AA. And, and I think God gave me that love so that I could find out that I am an alcoholic. Um, I didn't get sober in the rooms. God used one of my other symptoms to help save my life, which is uh, relationships. And, um, I started hanging out with an old friend and, and he was in AA and I, I knew I was super attracted to him, but I thought it was just for looks. But what was so attractive to, about him was he had a solution, you know, and I didn't have one. I had God in my life. I was sober. Um, I was white knuckling it and I did not have a design for living, right? Like my life did not really take off until I came to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, you know, but like while we're together, I'm like, I'll do my Jesus stuff. You do your AA stuff and we'll just leave each other alone and meet in the middle, you know? Um, and he always had like these super interesting things he'd say, he'd talk about acceptance and gratitude and all these like big, amazing things to me. And it, I started reading the big book and I'm like, oh, wow. Like he was just taking this from the big book. You know, I thought he was like super amazing, um, which he is, but like, 
that was from the big book. Um, you know, and, and I did have a psychic change and, um, I continue to have psychic change changes, right? Like I, I'm always having these spiritual awakenings where this, this solution becomes even more real in my life, right? COVID sucked for everybody. Um, I think for me, I, this pat, like with meetings being closed, I got to really see how strong my program was. Um, so I have a sponsor that became a sister and a best friend to me and like her kids are like my nephew and my nieces, right? Um, she had a baby that was born with a genetic defect and he was very, very sick. And I, and I got to, um, you know, shoulder that burden with her and then, um, take care of a very sick baby with her and, and then got to go there while she was holding her dead son. You know what I mean? And, and, um, while that's all going on, um, I had a business at the beginning of COVID that I was losing. Right. So all these things start to pile up and, um, I was supposed to get married, uh, two months ago and obviously not married. So that, that was starting to, to fall apart. Um, and all these things, right. That I was just like, I was like begging God, like, if you just put this back together or this back together, like, it's okay if you take this, right. Like bargaining with God, which it doesn't work like that. Um, you know, like it felt like God was taking everything from me, you know, but like it, it was the best thing that I could have walked through. Um, especially with like meetings being closed and only having zoom, I really got to see like, how bad do I want this? You know what I mean? How bad do I want to work for this? How bad do I not want to pick up a drink? Um, and so, um, you know, God did take all those things. He didn't, he didn't leave any of them. He, he took the relationship, which I, I thank God so much for today. Right. Cause like that relationship was ran on fear. Um, and, um, I've gotten to see my, my favorite step is step three. Right. Um, and I get to see that walked out in my life. It wasn't like a one-time choice right? I'm like, all right, I give you my will in my life. No, like that is walked out probably about a million times a day for me. And I got to see how much I really meant that. Um, so like I said, we lost the baby. Um, God took that relationship, which, um, thank God he did. Cause I almost married someone completely out of fear. Um, you know, I, so the first man that I've probably ever been in love with sober, um, he was one of us and he lost his battle to this disease. Right. Um, and it, it rocked me. It broke me in ways that I did not think I could break. And, um, but it also made me even more aware why I do surrender my will in my life. Right. Because there was a year in my life, I begged God to keep this man in my life. Right. But he relapsed, um, not long after we broke up and getting to see what God already saw way down here, um, you know, down the road a little bit, helped me to trust him a lot more. Right. Because if I, if God would have been like, okay, yeah, no, you're right, Nicole, you should have everything exactly as you want it. Like who knows where I'd be right now, you know? And that doesn't, and that's why it's like, it's like a, I practice these things, right? I practice these principles in all of my affairs. I'm not perfect at them. Um, I struggle with them a lot. Some days I'm full of fear and it can almost rule my life. Um, sometimes I want to take my will back. Um, but I've learned when I do follow the steps as they're outlined, I get to be happy today. You know, um, like I can have a thought of a drink and it not turn into a, an obsession today. And to me, that's a freaking miracle, man. I used to think about a drink and I was already at the bar. You know, today I can think about a drink, call my sponsor and, and, you know, do the things necessary to stay sober, you know, through some really rough stuff. Um, you know, now I'm in this new season of change where I get to start a new job because that business ended. Um, I get to be single and just be with God and see what that's like. Um, I I've gotten to continue to work with new women all throughout this COVID pandemic, because, you know, if you pray for sponsees, God's going to bring those to you, you know? So I've, I'm sponsoring women right now. I've never even met, um, which is really an amazing experience for me. Um, you know, and I, and I've noticed too, like all these things that we're usually praying for God to take away from us is usually what God's going to like 
grow us into the people we're supposed to be right like if, if i would have seen this whole season outlined i probably would have been like all right god let's skip over this this chapter let's just you know roll with it um but i'm so grateful that i do surrender my will and my life over to god today because then it gives me that peace and acceptance walking through these things to know that like all right god i don't like how it looks but i trust you right that's the only difference like i don't think this program calls you to like just like uh love torture right no it, it, it just helps you to surrender to something bigger than you and whatever that looks like right we all have like there's like so many different higher powers within aa and i just think it's cool that a group of drunks can um you know surrender to something bigger than themselves right um and stay sober through it um <clears throat> through this program i've been able to uh, have a relationship with people that I never thought I would, um, because now I get to see that I'm not a victim, right? I, there's that fourth column that on my first, uh, fist four step, I, I left out my part, you know, which is the whole point, you know, and my sponsor's like, what the heck? I think you missed the point. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, you know, but like what a gift today I get to see Nicole has a part, right? And that's the only thing I have any control over, right? And I get to grow into a better person today. Um, and, and me being that better person today is able to have a, a relationship with my sick dad and, and know that he is the way he is. But hey, maybe if I just show him, show up and be like the only big book he's ever read, that might like do something for him, you know? Uh, today I get to have like amazing friendships and relationships because this program's taught me how to say sorry and make amends. That's not something I was ever able to do, right? Like I, pride is my number one character defect and, and I would ride that out. You know, I never had anything to, to apologize for anyone because don't you know what you did? Um, you know, and that's another miracle that this program has given me. Um, outside of the miracle of not having to pick up when life sucks. Um, I'm sorry. I'm getting nervous because I'm trying to be out of here by nine for you guys. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's nine oh nine. Thank you guys for having me. I'll wrap that up. Let's go. Hi everyone. My name's David. I am an alcoholic, and um, I'm very grateful to know that today. <laughs> and I want to thank Scott. For, he actually asked me to come and speak for you guys before the pandemic hit. I was actually looking to come down to your basement. and uh, But here we are. Thank God we have technology. Back when I got sober, we didn't have technology. We didn't have cell phones, computers. And I don't know what we would have done back then. But I'm really grateful for this because it's keeping me connected. And I want to welcome the newcomers. I want to welcome the people that chimed in from around the country to this meeting. That's another great factor of zoom meetings is we can go wherever we want as long, long as we have the code you know and uh happy birthday to those celebrating a birthday and you know my uh, sobriety date is august 7th 1992 it's the only sobriety date i've ever had i came to alcoholics anonymous and you guys grabbed me by my collar and yanked me in and uh i've kind of been here ever since you know and first and foremost i haven't taken a drink a pillar of fix and a little over, you know, over 27 years. And if you knew that's, that's the first step. The first thing you got to do is just don't take anything. You know, that's, that's how you get time. And if you want to change your life, get a sponsor and work this program It changed my life. And when I first got here to Alcoholics Anonymous, um, it was really hard for me to hear what you guys were saying. Charlie Brown parents were very loud in my head. That's what you guys kind of sounded like you guys were talking in terms and God and all this stuff and I, you know, all I wanted to do was not drink when I got here, but I wasn't hearing what you guys really were saying. Um, and then I started understanding, seeing steps on the wall. And the first thing my head was telling me is I'm not doing those, you know, uh, I'm not doing inventory. I'm not giving my information to anybody. I'm not telling my secrets, you know, that's the thinking that I came in with, you know, and, you know, once it got defogged and I stuck around here for a while and gave up my old friends and you guys became my new friends and family, my life began to change. And, uh, you know, the book says we talk about what it was like, what happened, what I'm like today. Uh, I grew up here in uh, Los Angeles. I actually grew up in a motel over on La Cienega Boulevard. Um, my whole family was in the motel business and my parents had one on La Cienega and Airdrome. 
and I was about 10 when I, when I finally, the light bulb went on, why anybody would rent a room for an hour. And, uh, you know, uh, I was a little embarrassed by that with my friends and, you know, my parents had us changing beds, you know, and, and, um, you know, it's a little bit of something that'll make you feel a little different when you're going to school and all your friends living in houses and apartments around you and you're living in a motel. But, you know, I look back on now, it was actually kind of cool. My friends actually dug it. They actually helped me make beds so I can get out and play a lot faster. You know, uh, you know, I had, you know, two parents, I had siblings, brothers and sisters, and, you know, I had the, the normal type of childhood that, you know, I hear some of us have, not all of us, you know, we had dinner every night at 5.30 and, you know, I went to school across the street and all that kind of stuff. I liked boys as a little kid and I didn't know anything was wrong about that until I started hearing stuff on the playground. You know, uh, the first thing that made me feel different is guys were telling me and the church I was going to were saying that kind of stuff was wrong. And so my, I learned to, my first thing was that's something nobody's, I can't tell anybody about, you know, so I learned to stuff that down. When I was 12, I went to a friend's bar mitzvah and uh, they, they let us drink whiskey and Cokes and I got my first drunk on them. and I really liked it. I liked the taste of it. I liked it when I was growing up. My parents used to put brandy on our gums when we got toothaches and stuff like that. My dad would give us little sips of beer when he, my mom made spaghetti dinner. And um, I really liked the flavor of alcohol. I loved alcohol. And what I discovered at 12, that first drunk, is I liked the effects produced by alcohol. Now, I, I didn't know anything about alcoholism back then or allergy or obsessions. And I don't tell you the truth. I don't think I was obsessing on it after that first drink or that I had the allergy to it because I didn't get up the next day and crave it and, and go drinking. But I remember thinking that it was really fun because I got up the next day and my, you know, my brother was driving then and we went down surfing with our friends. And I remember going, yeah, we got really drunk last night at so-and-so bar mitzvah, you know, and, um, but by the time I was 14 in junior high school, uh, other things were easier to come by. And so I was starting to do that kind of on a daily basis before going into school. And, you know, school um, was never much for me. I was kept back in second grade. Um, teachers sounded like Charlie Brown's parents to me. I couldn't sit still in my chair. They would have probably diagnosed me with one of those other uh things they diagnose kids with today and put me on something, but I don't think they were doing that back then. But my mom got me a tutor for reading and I didn't like that. And I didn't like doing homework. I'd rather be outside playing. I always wanted to be outside. I never wanted to be inside. And I was one of those drunks that didn't like to stay home. I like to go out all the time up until I got sober. I was always out and about, always getting in trouble because I wasn't a stay at home drunk. But uh, by 14, you know, like I said, I was a uh, doing something pretty much on a daily basis. And this girl I knew when I was in eighth grade came to me one day and she goes, hey, I found these things in my grandma's cabinet. They're supposedly really good. If you help me sell them, I'll give you some for free. And the next day I got caught and I got expelled out of my first school and I went to another school and I just found other kids that did the same stuff. There was a girl that used to hang around on the playground and she used to bring a Snoopy thermos with her every day full of vodka and she became our new best friend so there I wasn't by that time it was ninth grade at this other uh, uh, junior high and we're drinking vodka and dropping two and alls going to classes you know and that's I'm just I look back now it's just a little kid you know but that was uh what I was doing and you know I have friends ask me these days where I went to high school and I always just say I was enrolled because by the time I got there I never went I was always down at the beach surfing, hanging outside the liquor store, asking people to buy us uh, buy, uh, quarts of beer. And I was dropping quaaludes back then. And I wasn't a big pot smoker. I hung around some what they called stoners in high school. And those were guys that I knew that would just smoke pot and lay around the house all day long. And I was not a lay around the house kind of guy, you know. Um, you know, I'm hanging around the beach. I'm hanging around a lot of people that like to do things I do. Some of the kids I grew up with where, you know, I started playing Little League when I was a kid and I gave that up because I didn't like competitive sports. And I didn't like my dad who was the manager. And uh, I got involved in surfing and, you know, individual sport. And um, that's all I wanted to do. I just wanted to get loaded. I wanted to surf. 
I wanted to act. I wanted to be like those guys I was hanging around down on the beach and they were all starting to, look, starting to like the girls. And I thought I could change. And when I drank, I felt a little bit more comfortable talking with girls. And so, you know, I would ask girls to go steady with me and be my girlfriend because I needed a cover, you know, and my hair was growing real long. I was a bleached blonde surfer kid hanging around Santa Monica with the, with the attire we wore back then, Opie shorts, bands, uh, sneakers, blue and red they had to be, um, you know, hanging around with the girls. I was living this life that really wasn't me. But as long as I was loaded, I could I can do that, you know. Um, when I was about 16, I remember, you know, I would uh, also, when I was loaded, I would uh, manipulate my fr some of my guy friends. I lost some friends that way while we were very drunk, you know, talking them into doing things they really didn't want to do with me. And uh, But there was this one kid, he was this Jewish kid, Jeff, I used to hang around and we became really good friends. And I stayed at his house all this time. His parents really liked me and they fed me breakfast. And when I got really close with the family and him and I had this little thing going on, you know, it was our secret together. And we both had girlfriends. And one night um, I stayed over at his house and we were doing our thing. And his mom walked in and the shit hit the fan. You know, I got thrown out of that house. I was banned and told never to come around there again, never to see him. All this shame came on me. It was like, God, who I am is when what I was doing, I was told I was wrong, you know, and, and I kind of, I had to live with that. And if his dad knew I was with him with other friends, his dad would track us down and chase me and chase me around, you know, mm -hmm. get away from my son. I mean, they really hated me and I learned to hate myself, you know, I learned to drink a little bit more on top of that because I needed that pain of what happened to go away and um, who I was I didn't like and uh I wanted to change who I was I didn't want that it just became my secret and you know I just became a little tougher kid I started getting arrested back then and I got a lot of attention when I got arrested I got a lot of street cred back at the beach when I'd go back oh we heard you got busted last night and you know by the time I got sober I got arrested when you guys say uh any alcoholics here I went like this and went oh just like the old days hands up you know um I've been dragged off the beaches i've been dragged out of school i've been dragged out of my parents house i've been caught in dea stings um i've gone to jail dressed as madonna um on halloween uh I, just all this stuff i did while under the influence and you know when, by the time i got here my first sponsor had me do an arrest inventory and i did that and you know that's just stuff that happened to me when i was under the influence i had friends that got in trouble like that that one day they gave everything up, went to college, got families, and went on with their lives. They weren't alcoholics. Me getting in trouble didn't make me the alcoholic. I didn't even know back then that was once I put the alcohol in me, I was on, I was, I was on a tear. And I never tried to give it up. And I never, not until I got the Alcoholics Anonymous, and I heard people saying that they had prayed, please, God, and pleaded, get me through this, and I'll never drink again. I never said that. Whenever I was in jail, the only thing I thought about was getting out and having a drink. That's all I can think about when I was locked up. Let me get out and get a drink. And when I was 23, my mom died of brain cancer. And she was like 46. She was young. And any kind of little higher power I had been uh, kind of given as a child because I was taken to church, I, I let go of at my mom's funeral when the priest at the church said my mom was now with God. And I remember inside going, if there was a God, he wouldn't have taken my mom. That was really angry. And right there, whatever little thread I had hanging on that was gone. So I, I never said a prayer. I never said a plead to anything out there. Oh, get me out of this. Never. It never even crossed my mind. I had let it go. And I went on for the next nine years of just drinking, getting in trouble, getting this job, this job, that job. Um, and it was just a way of life for me. You know, my, the friends that I had when I was a little younger, maybe in younger 20s, started leaving me because I was starting to find friends. That were like me because I was getting worse and the friends I used to hang with were letting this go and going on with their lives they didn't have what I have which is the disease of alcoholism um, when I was 28 I started crewing for this heavy well hair metal rock band that was playing around Hollywood and I got this idea in my head that this band was going to make it actually they were really good they were getting a lot of attention but I got this obsession with a tour bus in my head that we're going to do this we're going to go on tour and i'm going to get on this bus and it became an obsession and uh i'd been let go from one job where i where i met some of these guys and i was 
off of work and uh, my sister liked to find jobs for me and I was living with my dad at the time, me and my sister. And uh, she found this job ad for this law office in Brentwood. So I went on this job interview. I had hair halfway down my back. You know, I didn't have a really clothes to wear. I just put on a pair of jeans and my dad's shirt with my marbles hanging in my pocket. I smoked back then. And I went on the job interview and, you know, the office manager was really cool. You can smoke everywhere back then, you know, and she said, oh, I see you smoke this smoking office. You can smoke if you want. So I lit up during my interview and I sat with this lady and then I left. And an hour and a half later, she called and said, hey, you got the job. And I went to work that the following Monday and I went to work, uh, working in the copy room of this large law firm in Brentwood, you know, and uh, it was just in my head, it was going to be a temporary job. It was just going to be a job until the band got going, you know, and I started doing that. And at 4.30 every day, I had to get out of there. And I didn't know back then. I knew when I got here and started going to work, it's because I was jonesing for a drink. Because one of the things I didn't do when I worked was drink because I needed that money. But come weekends, I'd wake up in the morning and start drinking. Come Monday, it would take me a whole day to recover at work, you know. But at 4.30, I had to get out of there. I had to get that first drink in. Then I'd go to the rehearsal studio. Weekends, we were playing shows. We were traveling in these bands. And that was my way of life. And that's what I was looking forward to. And uh, in 1990, the music scene changed. The band broke up. And I felt stuck working in this law firm. You know, I'm stuck working here. I'm supposed to get on that bus. Uh, I didn't know that I couldn't stop drinking. I was drinking every day. I was a blackout drinker. I was driving every night. I always drove cars. Um, I had a suspended license. I still drove anyway. Um, when I was younger, I was good at buying cheap cars for like two, 300 bucks and not registering them. And when they would break down, I'd leave them on the streets because they couldn't come back to me. So I had a habit of not registering my vehicles and never had insurance either. And I was driving every night in a blackout. And those things, my friends couldn't get my keys away from me. And in 1990, I got my last DUI, and uh, I'd done so many diversion programs up until that point, and they sent me to a drunk school, drunk driving school, and it was there in 1990. They said I had to attend a, at least six AA meetings, and they gave me one of those court cards, and and uh, they said there's a meeting house down the street if it's convenient for you, and so the next night, I went to a meeting over at the Alano Club over on Pico Boulevard. I had my vodka and squirts before I walked in. I was just going there to get that card signed. And I sat through a that meeting. And all I remember is people saying something about sponsors, which I you know, didn't know nothing about. They were talking about God, which was like, get me out of this room. And uh, at the end of the meeting, I said to the guy next to me, hey, who here can sign these cards? And he said, oh, anybody here can sign those cards. And I said, well, then here, you sign it. He signed that card for me. And the next day I went to work and my buddy, Sean, I was working with, I said to him, I said, I'm never going back to this place. They sent me to last night. You're going to sign this card for me every week. And he did. And I never, never went back and it never st stuck in my head. It was just a place I didn't want to be at. And for two years, I went down. It was just starting to go down that rabbit hole. I was able to hold to that job because the managing partner, the managing lawyer of that firm I partied with, you know, they, they told me after I got sober that, that I was their entertainment. That's how they looked at me. Oh, you were our entertainment, you know? And um, for, for two years, I went down that rabbit hole. I was, that secret that I'd been carrying was really starting to come to the surface. And I hated myself. I hated me. The drink wasn't doing what it used to do. And, um, but I, I didn't ever thought of stopping. What I kept telling myself, I was uh, 30, but I was 32 and I figured I'd be dead by the time I was 35. And I was absolutely okay with that. Because I had gotten to the point where I couldn't see, as it says in the vision for you, I couldn't see my life with alcohol or without it. And I got to that jumping off place. And that jumping off place for me was on August 6, 1992. I uh, was renting a house with my dad in Santa Monica on 28th Street. We had this old house, had this old garage with wooden double doors. And, and um I was driving this little pickup truck back then and I pulled everything. I pulled everything out of the garage. There hadn't been a car in there since we lived there. We lived there for a year, just had our stuff. So I pulled everything out and put my little pickup truck in there and stuck a hose in a tailpipe and hopped in, closed everything down. And uh, I woke up a couple hours later with a screaming headache. I was uh, angry because I felt like I couldn't even do that either. And I, called my buddy that I worked with and I asked him to come over and he came over and what I had neglected to do was pull the hose out of the tailpipe and he didn't say anything when he got there I remember him staring at the garage and then he just said 
well, let's get your car out of there and put everything back before your dad comes home. Because my dad was driving a cab back then and he came home for lunch every day. And I didn't want him to find the mess. And so we did that. And then my friend took me to his house and his wife and him fed me beer the rest of the day. They fed me dinner that, that night and they drove me home. And they dropped me off and they said, we'll be back tomorrow morning to pick you up at eight o'clock. And I didn't ask any questions. And I got up on August 7th, 1992, and they picked me up at 8 o'clock, and they took me to St. John's Hospital. And I met with a doctor there, and uh, we talked a little bit with that doctor. He was suggesting I go and check into the hospital to relax for a few, few days. You know, we were going. There was other things that were said that I don't remember. You know, it was very much in a fog. And, uh, you know, everything that, you know, reality was hitting me, what I had done the day before. And... It was a Friday, and he suggested I go in that day, and in my head, I wanted one more weekend, and um, my friend said, no, 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 you're going in today, and I signed some paperwork, and the next thing you know, I was locked up on the 5150 in the psych ward at St. John's, and I spent the three days over that weekend detoxing pretty good, and um, I remember my dad coming in and a couple of friends, and then that Monday came around, and my doctor came in to see me and said, um, would you mind staying for a few more days? And I said, yeah, no problem, because I was not ready to leave and go face the world. I was feeling so much shame for what I had done, and I didn't want to go home where my dad was because I was like, God, his son just tried to kill himself. And I was like, and I didn't know what to do. I was really, mind was busy, busy. So I said, yes, I'll stay here. And that Monday, somebody, I was in a process group, and they said, hey, there's somebody here to talk about alcoholism. He's in the next room, if any of you want to go over there and two of us went over there and a guy had driven out from Pasadena he was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous that's what I remember I don't remember his name I don't remember his story I just remember he was there and at the end of, and the end of meeting with him he gave us each a big book and I went into my room that night with nothing to do and I started reading and in the beginning I got to the doctor's opinion and I started reading the doctor's opinion and kind of had an aha moment when I was read that part about the obsession of the mind the allergy the the phenomenon of craving that happens when I put a drink in me, because I always thought it was like drink number eight, drink number nine. I didn't know it was number one, but I never said I wasn't going to go and drink the next night. I always said, I'm just going to have a couple tonight. And I never had a couple. I didn't know once I started, I couldn't stop, you know? And I was also adding this white powdered supplement to my drinking habit back then. So I could drink a lot more, you know? And um, I ended up spending eight days there. They had H and I panels come in. Um, you know, I got a little bit more defogged as I was staying there. I was reading the book, and on day eight, my my I had an internist at the same time because I had a, a distended liver, and I had uh, they wanted to keep monitoring my liver. And on day eight, the psychiatrist came in and asked if I would join the rehab that they had at that hospital. And I said no. I completely balked at that, and I said I need to get out of here. And he said, well, I'll sign you out if you promise to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, I'll go to Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, they signed me out. Now, earlier I said every time I was in jail, the only thing I could think about when I got out was getting a drink. And, you know, in hindsight, I don't know what happened. But I got out of the hospital and I went home. And I got up the next morning and I went to work. I hadn't been there in, in eight days. There was two people there that knew where I was. And, and nobody really asked. And when I got off, I knew there was a meeting over on Ohio Street because a friend of mine did all his DUI AA meetings at this little building and my sister happened to live by it. So when I got off of work, I went and hung out at her house until the meeting. And uh, so I drove over to where the meeting was. I got over there 15 minutes before I think it was and I parked my vehicle across the street at the baseball fields and I was jaywalking across. I had to wait for the cars to go by and this other guy walked up and stood right next to me doing the same thing and looked at me and said, are you new? You know, now I dressed up for this meeting. I still had hair down to here. My hair went as long as out to here. And I had skull rings on all my fingers, hanging off my ears. I had black Doc Martens with white socks up to my knees. I had these blue shorts below my knees, a white wife beater tank top on. And I thought I was looking good. And he was in a suit and tie, you know, and asking me if I'm new. And I just blurted out, this is my first meeting. And he said, great, come with me. It's a busy meeting. We've got to get you a seat. And he led me into this meeting and there was teeth and hands coming at me. Everybody was smiling and laughing and it was smoke filled and these business cards were being put in my hand. I'm saying to this guy, what do I do with these? He goes, oh, you call people. And in my head, I'm like, I'm not calling anybody. I'm stuffing in my pockets. And uh, 
I didn't, wasn't smoking them, but I, what I remember from that meeting was uh, meeting Mark, who was my became my first sponsor, and him saying, what side of the room do you want to sit on? It's a smoking meeting. And I said, what's the difference? And he said, well, do you smoke? And I said, no. Well, he said, well, you won't get burned on this side. Because I remember it made me laugh. And it's the first time I had laughed in like nine days, you know. And at the end of the meeting, I didn't, I don't remember who the speaker was, what he said, nothing. But at the end of the meeting, he gave me a meeting directory with his phone number in it. And he had circled some meetings for the next night, which was a Tuesday. And I called him the next morning and I said, hey, which of these meetings are you going to? Because I wanted to go where he was at. He's the only person I knew. I was uncomfortable around my own friends unless I had drinks in me. And um, he said, I'm not going to any of those meetings, but just go to the ones I circled for you. And I said, well, what's the difference from the meeting that you're going to than the meetings that you circled for me? And he said, well, the meeting I'm going to is a gay meeting. And I said, well, that's my problem. And he kind of laughed. And he said, really? Well, then come down and meet me at this meeting. There used to be a meeting at Jocelyn Park in Santa Monica on Tuesday night. It was very large. And um, I drove down to Jocelyn Park. It had a big green lawn then. It's a dog park now. And uh, I met Mark there, and he was introducing me to some other friends. Now, I was more nervous going to that meeting than I was the night before. Why? Because... I never hung around gay people when I was closeted because in my mind, I would be guilty by association. Never had been to a gay bar, never had any gay friends, um, nothing. So I was really uncomfortable going there, you know, and I get there and everybody's really friendly and they're sitting with us out on the lawn. And Mark says, you know, your problem isn't that you're gay. Your problem is, is you're an alcoholic. And if if you go out and drink again, you're going to drink and die. But if you don't get honest with who you are, you're going to go back out, drink and die. In my head, I was thinking, this guy's really rude, you know. Um, but I look back now and I'm really grateful he said that. And, uh, and you know, so, I, you know, I, I went through that meeting and I was calling him for a couple of weeks. And I started to get what sponsorship was because people were talking about it in the meetings. And when it finally clicked, I was talking to him one morning and I said, sponsorship's kind of like, what you what i'm doing with you was i call you every day and he goes kind of and i said well will you be my sponsor and he said well are you willing to go to any length to get sober and, you know i didn't know what he exactly meant by that but i needed the sponsor and i said yes and he said okay you call me every morning like you yeah, have been but at 7 25 a.m no earlier no later i want you in a meeting every night during the week the same seven meetings every week i want you to get a minimum of three commitments and i want you to be at my house on thursday nights at six o'clock before the meeting to start going through the book and in my mind that was a really tall order in my mind it was screaming what but what came out was okay and uh so i started doing that i would get to work because we didn't have cell phones you know and uh, I'd get there early, and then at 7.25, I'd pick up the work line, and I'd call him, and I'd check in with him. You know, it was the same. Uh, what do you want today? Did you drink today? No. Can you stay sober today? Yes. Uh, meeting are you going to tonight? Do you have a commitment? You know, I started getting commitments at the meetings. I started showing up at those meetings. The first couple of weeks of sobriety, I used to have this house that I hung out at with about six people, and that was the party house. And so after the meetings, I was going back to that house. How I didn't drink or use is beyond me because they weren't hiding it from me, right? Ten minutes. One night I was sitting at the meeting and, uh, you know, some of the new friends I was meeting around AA, one of them was Randy. He doesn't live around here anymore. And I was sitting next to him at Tuesday night. And he said, hey, Dave, where do you uh, where do you go after the meeting? So I told him. He didn't tell me not to go there. What he said was, well, we go to coffee over at Abbott Kennedy after the meeting. Why don't you join us? And uh, I went out with a bunch of guys down to Abbott Kinney. And um, had a great time. You know, everybody was laughing. They were joshing one another. And I really liked it. You know, I've never been back to that house since. Those, those guys who I thought were my friends did not care about my sobriety. You guys did. And um, like I said, you guys grabbed me by the scruff of my neck and dragged me in here. And so I got, started going to these meetings every night. You know, they were okay. I was still... Uh, struggling a little bit with the obsession and Mark was having me pray and I was like I don't pray he was like just pray to stay sober today keep it really simple and I do that I was struggling with higher power and a few weeks into this I'm at a meeting and he said Dave are you still struggling with with God higher power and I said yes I said I get this image that pops up in my head when I hear that word and he said okay he goes do you think Alcoholics Anonymous is helping you stay sober 
And I said, absolutely. He says, do you think you could use Alcoholics Anonymous as a higher power? And it kind of switched something for me because I hadn't thought of anything like that. And I said, yes. And he said, good. G-O-D, group of drunks. There's your new higher power. And that was my beginning of letting go of whatever I had inside of me before that brought up anger and not wanting to adhere to that and bring in a new concept. And it really was great for me to say, you know, I turned my will and my life over to you and you are, it, AA is the people. It's the, the people that came before me. And about a month into sobriety, I was out again at that Tuesday night meeting and there was a guy across the room and I was like, wow, he's really attractive, you know? And for the first time I approached somebody that I was attracted to and I stuck my hand out and said, hi, my name's David. And he said, hi, my name's Bill. And we spent the next 11 years together. You know, um, my first date with him was to his sponsor's house. His, our, his sponsor was Ar Armando M who uh, interviewed me and you know, my sponsor interviewed Bill and just basically said, keep your program separate, and, you know, and, and Bill told me, he goes, you know, if you go at my program as number one in my life, it comes before you and everything else. He goes, you know, if you drink or use again, we're done. And, uh, and he was really involved and I really wanted to be with him. So I got more involved in AA because I wanted to be with this guy, you know, we would see each other on the weekends and we'd go out to dinner and, and a meeting. And then during the week, I was going to work, going to my meetings, going to my commitments, whatnot. And we did that for a year. And then when, when I hit a year, we moved in together and uh, we started a life. I started a life in a relationship. I had never had a real relationship ever in my life. I had never felt that way about another person and be able to express it to them. You know, I took hostages of my guy friends when I was out there. I had feelings for them, but I couldn't express it to them, you know, and, you know, we started this journey. And then when I was about five years sober, um, my my first sponsor was getting ill and he ended up going out and by that time. I mean, we, knew, my sponsor brothers and I knew he was ill and that he was on his way, but there was nothing we can do. And I remember taking a five year cake and there'd been a woman I'd known my whole sobriety. And I went up to her and I said, Hey, will you be my sponsor? And she said, I'd never sponsored a man before, but let's try this for 30 days. If it's not working for you or me, no hard feelings. Okay. And I said, sure. And she's been my sponsor now for almost 23 years, you know, and she took me through the steps again. And I used the same higher power to begin with, which was you guys. And uh, really got a better idea of, these, of the step work than I did the first time around in my first year when I was just going through my, without any knowledge just to try to go through them. I didn't, I didn't get, I don't, by the time I was five, I knew I didn't, I wasn't able to dig deep enough on my fourth step. It just, I just scratched the surface. And David, um, yeah. David, five minutes. You got it. Thank you. And, you know, one of the things that, uh, that came up in my, you know, for my ninth step was I had a little sister. She was eight years younger than me. When I was eight, she was born. She was born very sick. She spent a lot of time in the hospital. I was a mama's boy, but all the attention went to her. I hated her. I hated that baby. And I carried that into adulthood. And one of the things my sponsor says is you need to start including her in your life as part of your amend. You need to do that a living man. And I started bringing her inviting her to things and, you know, making her a part of my life and discovered, man, she's just like me, but I never said anything to her, you know, and uh, one day she did call and said she needed help, and uh, I give her a cake every year. She calls me her Eskimo. She's got 11 years of sobriety now, and I'm really grateful for that, and uh, back in 2003, September 2003, Bill and I went hiking every year, spent a week up at Mammoth Lakes, and we came home, and he came home with a cough. And 30 days later, he was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. And you guys rallied around us. You know, he went through all his treatments and we got through the holidays. And in January, he got retested and it didn't do anything. They basically said, put your affairs in order. And we did that. He said he wanted to die at home. So all the meetings came to the house. I was still working at that law firm. You know, by this time I was an office manager. I learned how to be a worker around workers. And you guys rallied around me. You rallied around him. And on February 3rd, 2004, he died that night in our house. And, uh, and you know, it was a really hard time. And I got through it through you guys. And you, somebody in AA had directed me to a grief group that I did some work there for, took some action there, which was a big help. You know, and my life took a big turn and went off in another direction. And I, you know, I lost my dad that same year and I met my now husband, Rick, that same year. And I met Rick that year and um, we decided to move out and buy a house. And we bought a house out here in Altadena where I live now, because that's where he was from. I've been out here for 
uh, 14 years and I still have that same sponsor. I have a lot of sponsees. I still have a lot of sponsees I met when I was over on the West side. And today, these days, I, you know, I go to, when I was regularly attending non-Zoom meetings, it was six meetings a week. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. It's, it's the first and foremost big thing in my life. I love being around you guys. One of the things I miss the most these days is the hugs. I love getting the meetings early and fellowshipping and the prayer at the end when we all hold our hands. I get power from that and I miss that big time. Now, I'm grateful for these Zoom meetings because it's keeping me connected. Um, during the day, you know, I lost my job as a result of the pandemic. So, you know, I'm at home all day long, my, you know, with my husband here and he's got his program and I have mine and I'm with my, talking with my sponsors on the phone all day long. Got a couple of newcomers I'm working steps with through Zoom. I'm grateful for that. Uh, you know, I don't know how long this thing's going to last. We made the decision on March 13 to shelter in place ourselves because my husband and it, we take care of his mom and she's elderly and got conditions and so does my husband. And so um, if they were to get this, they might not make it through. So we, we decided to do this on our own before they told us we had to. And I'm pretty content with it. I don't have necessarily like it, but I, I accept it. You know, there's a lot of craziness, I think, going on out there right now. And that's okay. That's people's own decisions to make my decisions to stay here and not worry about what anybody else is doing. Just take care of me and I'll be okay. I hope, you know, that's, that's, that's what I'm hoping for that we get through this. I look forward to the day when we can, we can all meet in meetings again, but until that time we're going to be on here. And so am I, I love that I can go to meetings all over the place and all the regular meetings that I attended are online. And I make sure I hit those two every week. You know, um, I want to thank Scott again for asking me, to uh, come here at first, you know, I've done a few of these and at first it was a little hard just staring at a screen, but you know what, it's not too bad. You know, it's not too bad. I, it's, it's a way that I get to participate for that, I'm grateful. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.